All right. Um, thank you for coming to uh, see me and choosing me over a smart thermostat. Um, so I have 20 minutes and 56 slides. I'm going to go as fast as I possibly can. If you don't understand something, I'm sorry. Evolution of data-driven software companies. So HVF, Hard Valuable Fun, is the incubator of ideas that I launched on this very stage except upstairs one year ago. What we do is we develop concepts, invest, create companies, whatever it takes to solve the world's biggest problems using data. And, uh, hey, move forward, there we go. We spend all of 2013 looking for the grail of the data-driven startup, the company that would help us solve an enormous problem or two or three using data and investing in such companies. What we've been basically trying to figure out in preparation for this talk is what have we learned? What's the evolution in our mind or in the world or whatever, in the most interesting data-driven software company. So here's a brief run through. The DNA of the successful data build out. Obligatory evolutionary slide. The old days of uh, data-driven companies is basically data aggregators. These guys have been around for a very long time. Companies like Axiom, TLO, they'll sell you anything from the sex offender database to um, professional union memberships. What these guys do, they just vacuum up the data that's available somewhere, anywhere, public, sometimes purchased, and resell it. Not a very high margin business. There's just not that much to do there beyond cleansing, deduplicating, collecting. They take the data before and after. They sell it to the highest bidder. They do it again. Boring business. Um, next one up. You can actually make sense of data. In this very audience is the man who told me that the best slogan in what I want to do with myself is make sense of data. The, I will not out him. But uh, making sense of data is a great way to make money. This is the segment where majority of the current financial success resides. This is where lots of really cool companies like Google and Yelp, anything that resembles some form of yellow pages. This is where the data comes in from the outside. There is the algorithm on the inside that makes, the sen makes sense of data, makes it more valuable, and resells it back. You can think of it as selling an API or access to the data, making the data create value for the buyer. There's a great business in that. There's a special segment, by the way, which is actually very, very cool. This is a lyrical side aside, but making sense of data for computers is pretty easy, but making decisions with data is very hard for humans. Sometimes the best way to make sense of a lot of data is not to crunch it down the powerful computer, but to visualize it and show it to a human. There's a whole bunch of these companies, and they all operate on data that comes from one side. They provide amazing visualization software. They help you make better decisions. Quid, a company where I'm an investor and on a board of, this is very quickly going to start being a little bit like talking up my own book, but I have been spending most of my time investing and building out this kind of stuff. Quid visualizes data that comes from patent applications, trademark, all kinds of crazy places. Anything that's externally publicly available, but it's so multidimensional, it's just too hard to make sense of. Another company called Palantir, you probably have heard about it earlier today. This is a company that takes intelligence data, primarily from within three-letter acronym agencies, and makes sense of it visually. This is, sorry, that's Palantir. This was, is Tableau. They take internal data and help companies make more sense out of what's going on inside their logs. There's also a company called Splunk that does the same thing. So this is just a massive type, make massive category. The really interesting thing about all these companies, you can encapsulate their process with the word enrich. They take data, they enrich it. These are some uh, tasty Iranian, actually these are in New Mexico, but these are centrifuges, they're enriching uranium. Uh, I was going to throw up Ahmadinejad on the screen and then realize that uh, we have a new guy in power. The um, enriched data gets better and better as you add data sources and you improve the algorithm. The algorithm is typically kept secret. The data is typically public. At some point, you reach critical mass. The data explodes, and you reach what's known as the network effects of data. You've probably heard of network effects. Network effects of data is something that we think we came up, not the concept, but the name. What it means is that you know so much about any one data source provider within your network that you are smarter than any number of them combined, which creates a permanent lock-in. Anyone giving you data wants the insight back from you. They do not ever want to switch. We love finding, founding, and investing in these kinds of companies. There's a list of our investments just in the last couple of years. There's also Google that has a deep network effect on data on both the advertising side. They know what each keyword is worth in advertiser. And for the customer, they know exactly how to rank order results. There's Yelp for reviews. 
There's all kinds of amazing companies network effects of data. If you find it, call me. I would like to invest in your company. The interesting example from, uh, I know this is very, uh, you know, this, this is the lyrical uh, side number two. Favorite example of network effects of data that are not immediately obvious is Monsanto. Monsanto is probably single the most reviled company in the world. When I was looking for this clip, or incidentally, all the images are copyrighted their respective owners. This is all from Google Images, don't sue me. Monsanto is not particularly well liked company. Actually, don't quite understand why. I could quite pin down all, the, all of their sins, but they nonetheless are an enormous publicly traded corporation. I think they're north of $60 billion. They take yield and profit data from farmers. They collect it from them. There's a really cool set of sensors on every John Deere tractor and the like that's been on there for the last 25 years. All this data comes off the tractors, goes to Monsanto. They figure out the highest yield utilization of resources on the field, and they develop seeds that can be sold back to the farmer with the knowledge of what seed will create the highest profit margin for that particular farmer. As a result, instead of selling, you, or selling farmers, anyway, seeds that just give them more useful results for a certain amount of money, they actually charge a tax on incremental revenue that this farmer will derive by using the particular kind of seed. They know more about the field of any one farmer than the farmer knows themselves. It's pretty amazing. Not a well-liked company. $60 billion can't be wrong. These guys have a pretty amazing network effect of data. Moving right along, this is where it gets really, really interesting. This is a very common topic. This is something that I talked about at length on stage last year. If you want more, Google my spiel here. This is known as the efficient use of inefficient or slack economic resources. I have a screwdriver. My next door neighbor has a screwdriver. We both bought screwdrivers, screwdrivers over there on the uh, in the hands of the um, the Neanderthal and the uh, Vitruvian man. Um, why in the world do we have two screwdrivers each gathering dust in each one of our garages? The probability of either one of us using a screwdriver is pretty much nil because both of us are nerds and we don't really know what to do with our hands except for typing. But even if I needed a screwdriver, I could just borrow my neighbor's screwdriver. Except I didn't know he had a screwdriver and he didn't know I had a screwdriver and we didn't know when we were buying these screwdrivers. Massive inefficiency. Both of us spend tons of money. These screwdrivers are sitting around unused. Enter the sharing economy. We made too much stuff, and all this stuff needs to be shared. Instead of owning a screwdriver for 35 years because these things are indestructible, you can just borrow a screwdriver if you knew where it was. This is now happening because we have sensors everywhere. Sensors sense where the screwdrivers are, or cars that are idling, such as for Uber, or apartment floors for Airbnb, or mattresses, or any kind of resource, all the way up to heavy cranes for construction. Sensors are everywhere. Some of them are for fun. Some of them are for more serious things like burglar alarms, the bicycle sensor over there is an obligatory mention on my part, and even for games, resources that are tied to human bodies. The next thing that makes this possible is the ubiquity of broadband. Anywhere you look, there's an antenna and a secret camera to go with it, and uh, these antennas are transmitting all the information about the location, availability, and schedulability of the sensors. The data about utilization of the resources being gathered, it's being thrown into the cloud by the sensor, but you got to trust the cloud. Fortunately, you can trust the cloud, except I'm going to do my best Benioff impression. Beware the false cloud. Mark Benioff and people like him have done an amazing service. This is really not to be understated. They took the notion of your secret data goes into a server somewhere else where you don't really have a clue how well it's being protected, and it's stored there, and you don't even have your own copy. From Dropbox, which is, of course, Slack resource sharing system for bits, or more like hard drives, to everything else. So the iconic companies of the sharing economy of the Slack resource utilization through data and better sensing, transmitting, queuing is Uber, Airbnb, and my favorite, Homejoy. That's probably because we're investors in this one. This is the Uber for cleaning ladies, or cleaning maids, to be more politically correct. There's always a cleaning lady somewhere that is waiting for her next assignment. Homejoy gives them all tablets, tells them where to go. High utilization, these people are getting paid better. They have full feedback from their customers and back. Amazing. We are going to be ripping through every imaginable resource you can possibly conceive of and adding this notion of a sharing economy on top of it, with some exception, but maybe not. There's a bunch of stuff that's going on right now. Some of these things are not immediately obvious, Slack resource utilization, but Kickstarter, for example, is basically the scheduling system for spare change. Instead of walking around and efficiently donating pennies to a guy in the street that seems to be particularly pitiful, you can use a centralized resource that figures out where your money needs to go and sends it to something as cool as Lockatron. 
There's Gettable, which is literally a company we're also investors that allows very large cranes and other construction equipment to be shared. There's Hotel Tonight, there's Relay Rides for Cars, there's Zipcar for Cars, there's Uber for Cars. And in addition to Airbnb, there's now Airbnb for dogs. Dog Vacay, soon to be mirrored by a obviously business to rent a puppy. While these dogs are sitting idle inside of a kennel, you too can look cuter than you normally are, take the puppy out for a walk, get a better date. So, <laughs> another lyrical aside, I'm actually doing pretty good on time. I thought I'd be uh, less than halfway through by now. Um, so, we spent a bunch of time trying to figure out how to get data out of sources. So, and by source, I mean companies or consumers. Companies are actually pretty rational. If you find yourself a source of data that you can convince a company giving up will allow for increased yield, better profitability, you can generally somehow convince the company to give it to you. There's a cold start problem. If you have one customer, it's hard to believe that they're going to be more efficient. If you have two customers, the shared data makes a lot of difference. With consumers, that's much harder. Consumers are completely inefficient. They will do the same thing over and over again and expect an outcome different, which is the definition of insanity by Albert Einstein. So we try to make a little cheat sheet of reasons why consumers will give up their data into this notion of centrally managed optimization of resources, theirs or someone else's. And here it is. We can just ask them to give it up to us without asking. Oh, wait. Um, so reasons user contributed over time. Need for recognition, the social capital, Yelp, Twitter, Facebook, all the companies where you're basically giving up your data, which in this case, your innermost thoughts are not so innermost. You are doing this because the company makes you feel like you get respect or you get status. The similar but slightly different version of it is a sense of identity where you attach yourself to someone else's status. Fitbit, Misfit, Jabba, and all the other fit companies, I'm an investor in one of these three and a user of all, um, they basically are all very, very busy trying to solve the halfway point of the sensor, the human biometric sensor problem. The human biometric sensor problem, the on the left is just tell us how many push-ups you did, in my case, 6,000, which is, of course, unverifiable. In the, I'm kidding about 6,000. This is the point that it's un unverifiable. The other one is the passive sensor, something that's in your floor mat as you're doing push-ups. It's just counting for you, transmits it into the cloud. In between, there's a sensor that you're aware of, but you're not ashamed of. It's the wearables, things that look pretty good, fashion statement, sensors, et cetera, et cetera. Fulfilled economic need is where you are giving up data while using. So you are not actually thinking about giving up this data. It just happens. When you pull out your phone and you fire up Uber, Uber already finds out that you need a car, or at least you're thinking of getting a car. Another twist on the social status is competition. Strava, something I use plenty of, quiz up, which is games. You are giving up your data either about your cycling ability or your general trivia knowledge by competing against people like you. There's a whole science set of scientists, little scientific papers around this stuff. It's really cool. The shorthand for all this stuff is dopamine. That's not alcohol, that's a dopamine. And uh, if you give people little kicks of, hey, that feels good, they will give you more data. The other version of giving people more data is just giving them a beautiful insight into what's going on, dashboard of their life. It doesn't work. Don't even try building that company. If you show up and you say, you know what, I will give you information about your heartbeat because that will prevent you know, a heart attack, people will find ways not to give the data to you because they don't want to think about heart attacks and also because they just get bored. Dopamine is much better than anything serious. So now it gets interesting because from all the stuff where you're basically standing on the sidelines and kind of doing all these clever things with data, boring or less boring, you can actually put your money where your mouth is. That is, take a bet. Take a side in whether data is valuable or not. Take a side whether you understand what's going on in the world or not. There's a whole bunch of this stuff going on. This is the next wave or the, the wave that's happening right now. One or the two that I'm going to cover really quickly is insurance. So Metro Mile is the first of its kind. There's maybe three or four of these being created right now in the States. There's probably something happening like this in Europe. I, I'm aware of one in England. This is basically the idea that instead of charging you for some basic statistical correlation, if you have a red car, you're going to go faster. If you go faster, you're going to get a ticket. We're just going to price your insurance around the notion of driving. Metro Mile charges you per mile. If you've lowered your risk to zero because you're not in the car, you pay nothing in premium for that month. Much simpler, this is a really basic data utilization idea. Metro Mile, of course, isn't stopping there. They are plugged into the OBD2 port, which is a data port instead of every car, which traditionally is used by mechanics. Gives you every little bit of information about what the car is doing, where it's going, how it's been, if the engine is okay. All the data is sucked into a cloud. Sensor, cloud, pricing, your premium goes up and down based on how well you've taken care of your car. 
a company that I am part of. This is the second spin out HVF did. We formed a company, funded it, built it. This is a completely different, but it's a health insurance play. What we do is we've built a fertility tracker for women that using biometric data and entry data, and we're looking for passive sensors. If you have a passive sensor startup in mind, please talk to me. Gather all the possible information that predicts ovulation in a woman and suggest to her when it might be the, great, the best time to try to have sex to conceive. If the conception is successful, and by the way, we have been stunningly successful at aiding people of evade what amounts to a very, very, very expensive and quite painful set of infertility treatments, if we're not successful at it, we will actually sell you health insurance where we'll drastically lower the cost of infertility treatments. Fertility in the US, in Europe this is well covered, in the US it is both ridiculously expensive and almost entirely not covered by employer insurance. Moving right along, there's not been a lot of innovation in credit, which is kind of the dual-sided insurance, other than prepaid debit cards and cleavage. The uh, most interesting innovation that's happening in credit today on the internet using data is payday loans. This is traditionally the service for those who cannot get a bank loan, service for those that cannot afford a loan except for a ridiculously high rate. They're companies like Cabbage and Wonga in the UK and now in the US, Zest, LendUp, all these companies are, will give you a loan at a rate that is typically cheaper, although not that cheap, based on some non-standard source information. They interrogate their customer and do a relatively fast, typically within minutes, they can decide what sort of a loan you can buy. A firm, which is the company I spend most of my time on, hence the t-shirt and the giant logo, is the first spin, -up that, spin out that we did out of HVF. We took the, the concept farther, basically saying, if we take a look at your social data and figure out where you're shopping, what are you buying, and who the merchant is, we can so tightly underwrite the risk that we can give you an instant decision that is literally as fast as swiping your card, more convenient than typing in your card because you don't actually have to enter any information, and it is completely transparent and priced to kill. This is an awesome company. We're going to take it very far this year. Self-commercial over. So this is actually... I have two and a quarter minutes to tell you what the future looks like. So this is pretty much the cutting edge of data, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I can see anyway. What happens next? Now that we've done modeled, we have finished modeling uncertain downside, which is what the purpose of insurance is, we're going to start modeling uncertain upside, which is known as precognition, for those of you who are fans of Philip K. Dick. It's the shot of the Minority Report. These things are people. They are predicting the future. They vote, and the Minority Report is the one that lost but should have won. Um, the elephant in the room is Amazon, not Barbar. The thing about Amazon is they just registered a patent on zero-click shipping. What they're doing is they're basically saying, if you are buying things and we have enough data about you, we're going to predict what you're going to buy before you actually bought it. Precognition, predictive modeling, or essentially anticipatory marketing. We're going to put a bucket of jelly into your peanut butter subscription on Prime. And if you don't want it, you can send it back. But if you do want it, you can keep it and just pay regular price. To the consumer, this looks ridiculously good. You got a free bucket of peanut butter to go with your jelly, and it's peanut butter jelly time. But to the guy that sold you jelly before, if you are indeed a jelly buyer, they've just been put out of business by Amazon. Because from now on, you're just going to checkbox include jelly inside the peanut butter shipment. This is going to be an enormously powerful change. Where prediction of your buying behavior or the corporate spending or marketing or all kinds of research utilization will be done at a, such an anticipatory level that the provider will make a bet with you that they know what you need before you need it. Here's roughly what it looks like. When I pull out my phone to call Uber, I'm telling Uber maybe a little bit of what I want, but really it doesn't have to be that way. Uber can just know when I'll be next because there's a GPS tracker on me already in the form of my phone. The car will just roll up, the door will open. If I don't want it, I don't want it. Uber lost a couple of bucks worth of gasoline, but if I did need it, well, by God, then Uber just took a customer out of Lyft and Sidecar. Kayak should pretty much know that I need a hotel based on my previous hotel shopping and the fact that I'm opening up Kayak to buy a, an airline. So Precog will uh, figure that out. So this goes on and on. The reason this is so important is because this is ultimately a cheaper way of doing a life extension. By eliminating the point of decision, the eliminating the point of thinking about what you're going to need next, you're packing more value and meaningful existence into people's lives, which results in happy seniors and uh, longevity. 
And that's it. Thank you for listening. I'm exactly on time, which I have to say I'm proud of, because I normally either run very long or get people wondering if this is the end because there's too much time left. Um, if you are thinking of anticipatory startup, if you are building a next, 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 something that I couldn't figure out for this presentation, please talk to me. This will be a lot of fun. That's all I spend my time on. Thank you.